Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming through the rain. Uh, it, it will be worth it. We have Serbi Gosh here with us tonight. Um, bonsoir and bienvenue. My name is Tamar El Sheikh. This is the final lecture in the 2016 Conversations in Contemporary Art series. A very special one, a, a curtain closer with our very own Serbi Gosh. Welcome, Serbi. For those of you who don't know yet, Conversations in Contemporary Art is a graduate seminar based in the MFA Visiting Artist Program. It provides a unique opportunity to hear dynamic and influential artists, critics, curators, and cultural workers speak. Through the series, the seminar participants, as well as members of the public and Serbi students who've come out in droves tonight, um, get to a chance to interchange with our guests and reflect on key themes in global contemporary art. I invite you to join us for the Sika lectures every second Thursday, uh, that's the plan for now, uh, over the course of next year uh, in VA 114, question mark. We're not sure about that. Uh, details to be confirmed. Uh, Serbi's work <laughs> considers the liminal power of the decorative the visual phenomena that permeate the edges of the spaces we inhabit. Her work poses key questions. What is the communicative function of ornamental patterning in private daily life and in public cultural spaces? Where is it positioned in systems of belief, value, and political power? Her work maps points of intersection between abstraction, minimalism, and ornamentation while expanding on a speculative understanding of these and other imbricated histories. Repositioning ubiquitous and universal motifs, circles, dots, hexagons, and stripes, Serbi builds complex compositions through accumulative mark making. She received her master's in fine arts in the fibers department at Cranbrook uh, Academy of Art uh, and since 2014, she's been here at Concordia University uh, as assistant professor program coordinator in fibers and material practices. You know her well. Welcome, Servi Gosh. Thanks, Tamar. Um, yeah, so thank you to um, everyone involved with Sika, especially Tamar, um, for inviting me and hosting me, um, and for all of you for coming. Um, so I'm going to um, just say that <laughs> I'm breaking my own rule tonight. <laughs> I always write my lectures. Um, and I read them because otherwise I get a little bit scattered and all over the place. Um, but I didn't write this lecture. <laughs> so I'm going to, um, there's a lot going on in my work and I'm gonna try to sort of take you through ideas um, in a potentially entangled way, but we'll see. Um, and yeah. Uh, I don't know if it will sort of work in this context, but um, if any of you ever feel like you want to ask me a question while um, in between slides or in between statements, please feel free to. Um, so, yeah. Um, let's do it. <laughs> um, my, um, there's two aspects for in my work that kind of come up over and over again. The first is pattern, and the second is narrative. Um, I was recently reading a book um, called Diasporic Feminist Theology, and I came across this quote that I just had to write down and borrow from my talk today. The author explains that, generally speaking, scholars use the term diaspora in two ways, empirical, historical, and metaphorical. And the two often get entangled and interrelated in the construction of diasporic consciousness and subjectivity. So she's talking about the understanding of the, the idea of diaspora. But for me, these words really stood out because um, I have been recently more and more aware 
that mining the entanglements between these two methodologies is in fact my method of being an artist. Um, so as I talk tonight through a few bodies of work and research areas, um, I'm gonna kind of skip around the past 10 years or so. Um, I'm gonna refer to the research areas that you see on the screen, um, where I move between empirical, historical, and metaphorical perspectives. Um, I'm gonna kind of rush through some of the early stuff, so um, sorry about that, but it's only to give you some background and then I'll slow down near the end when I talk about current projects. Um, I'm gonna end with project, a project that's very, very much unfinished. Um, another thing that I usually don't do in slide talks. Um, and I'm hoping that some of your questions and your feedback at the end will give me some new food for thought. Um, so these words that are on the screen, I kind of like sprinkled them into the slides here and there just to kind of help, help me <laughs> and you keep track of what I'm talking about. Um, so when I was in grad school, um, I was in a fibers program. I don't know if you know anything about Cranbrook, but there's no classes there. <laughs> um, and it's basically like a two-year residency where you think about your own research and your own making. Um, and sort of supplement that in however you, you need to. So even though I was in fibers, I was dealing primarily with um, visual storytelling, comics. Um, I thought about the creation of characters, the use of alter ego. Um, and after grad school for a few years, narrative and storytelling definitely remained my focus. Um, I drew a lot. I thought about authorship and appropriation. I started teaching comics classes at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I did a lot of research into narrative textiles, and I made a lot of handmade um, edition books, so small edition books. Um, the ones that I'm gonna flip through, um, what I'm doing with, in these books is I'm studying the work of some of my favorite storytellers. Um, so for example, this one was a tribute to Samurai Jack. Um, and I also looked at books from my childhood that I, was, I sort of see as the root of my preoccupation with loving narrative so much. Um, I basically, I, I deconstructed these works and sort of picked out a few elements from here and there, and then recombined them again into new abstract narratives, where the storylines were basically just the accumulative construction of patterns. Um, this was a flip book project um, where I examined the architectural ornamentation of Louis Sullivan. This is a fun little animation to show you what the flip book did for one chapter. Um, and this book focused specifically on the shape of the circle um, and how the circle is used to express the inexpressible, the intangible, the infinite, and the unknowable. Um, this book was set up as a kind of alphabet book for children. Um, the, the title is See Ouroboros Run. It was a collaboration with my partner, Rob Hunt, who's sitting right there. Um, and um, we were kind of riffing off the catchphrase sea spot run um, that was in, for those of you who know, the Fun with Dick and Jane books um, that taught kids how to read. Um, I have a note to myself to go quickly because I knew I was going to slow down because I love this book. Um, <laughs> it was really, really great uh, experience. Um, putting this book together. Um, we did a lot of research together and sort of cobbled together various sources. Um, I'm just going to read this quote that we put on the title page by Charles Fort um, that says, wise men have tried other ways. They have tried to understand our state of being by grasping at its stars or its arts or its economics. But if there is an underlying oneness of all things, it does not matter where we begin. One measures a circle beginning anywhere. So what we did was we found um, something, like a word for each letter in the alphabet, and then I did an illustration. That's the whole book, just takes you through the alphabet. And it's all images related to circular shapes and or sort of ways of searching for meaning and order or kind of mis mysterious um, artifacts that the purpose of which is, is sort of a little bit fuzzy or unknown. Um, I was at this time I was doing mostly drawing and painting work um, and it was always underpinned by my um, background in textiles. I have a, a BFA and an MFA in fibers um, 
And my painted work was basic in simple form, but I was working on building complexity in terms of overall surface, and they were all done with the application of tiny painted dots. Um, when I was putting this lecture together, I was thinking about Robert Irwin for some reason, um, and I wanted to include a couple of ideas um, related to Irwin's work as I flip through these slides. Um, Robert Irwin's notion of art derived from a series of experiential perceptions. As an abstract, open-minded thinker, he presented experience first as perception or sense. He concluded that a sense of knowing or ability to identify helped to clarify perception. So for example, we know the sky's blueness even before we know it as blue, let alone as sky. He explained later that the conception of an abstract thought occurs in the mind through the concept of self. Following the physical form is then recognized, communicating the form to the community. Then the objective compo compound occurs, delineating behavioral norms and artistic norms, becoming identifiable. Then the boundaries and axioms introduce logic and reasoning, and decisions can be made, either inductive or deductive. The study done by Irwin suggests that all ideas and values have their roots in experience that can be held separate at any point and developed directly on the grounds of function and use, both that they in fact remain relative to the condition of both our subjective and objective being. Um, his philosophy defined, defined his idea of art as a series of aesthetic inquiries, an opportunity for cultural innovation, a communicative interaction with society, and as compounded historical development. Um, I think this was about 2009, 2010. Um, I started compiling and sorting through um, visual examples of patterned materials from around the world. I was using a, um, image, a digital image archive that the Art Institute of Chicago um, had available for the community. So I was sort of sorting through this, this database um, and delineating and categorizing types of patterns. I was mostly looking at textiles and architecture, which I think of as you know, related to both our bodies and the spaces that we inhabit as well as adorn. Um, my selection process was by no means objective. <laughs> it was informed by my existing interest and my aesthetic leanings. But I did try to note how I was making choices um, while I was sifting through this imagery. Whenever I came across one that seemed familiar, I was often really excited to find out that the location of origin would explain the familiarity. So for example, what I'm showing you here um, are two examples from Gujarat, which is where my mother is from, and an example from Bengal, where my father is from in India. Um, and these are um, examples of my first category, which I called um, border patterns. These are some examples of, of overall or field patterns. Um, and I was also really aware when I was sorting through these things that often I would pick American quilts, um, which is something that's um, been a, a, a long running interest and in part of my education in the American South. Um, here you can see another category that I called tiered hierarchical or architectural. Um, and here's another take on the tiered pattern where the pattern sort of starts from a center and then repeats outward from inside to out. Um, and what I'm responding to here is the use of pattern to frame pattern to frame pattern, um, or in other words, borders, which border borders over and over again, which is what I had been doing in a lot of my work. Um, a couple years earlier, I had actually done this, this project that was all about borders. Um, it started with this little painting um, from a body of work where all of the imagery just came from scalloped border patterns. And I basically blew it up um, to about 10 times the size, and I made it as a series of double-sided applique flags and titled it Outside In, which pointed to my attempt to bring the margins to the center and to reframe the peripheral as central. Um, so another way I sort of broke these things down into categories was I looked at motifs. Um, I, I'm not gonna go through all of them, 
Well, there's kind of a list of, of all the ways I categorize them. Things like plants, animals, figures, abstract, geometric motifs. Um, and of course, I found countless examples of the circle and the dot being used as decorative and compositional motif. Um, okay, so the last way in which I categorized my archive was by function. And um, I, I categorized the ways in which decorative pattern functions as language or code within communities. So for example, the embellished textile on the top records a, piv a pivotal scene from one of the major Hindu myths called the Ramayan. And the meticulously detailed sari on the bottom, known as a patola, is made with such an extremely laborious process, known as double ikat weaving, that wearing it can be interpreted as a sign of social status or can mark a ceremony as highly significant. <coughs> Um, I thought about Rangoli, which is a tradition that I grew up with um, from, from my family. Um, it's, it, it's used in a lot of ways, but here I'm, I'm showing photos of it being used to decorate a threshold to a space to delineate that space as temporarily sacred. So in this case, this is my grandmother's um, doorway, the doorway to her home being prepared for my wedding ceremony. Um, I realized that my work was most directly informed by the communicative function of pattern that acknowledges the limits of language and the <coughs> limits of representation. So the photo on the left shows a woman who's adorned herself with the Hindu god Rama's name, repeated over and over again, repeated to infinity to encompass the inexpressibility of her faith as she makes a pilgrimage to the Ganga River. <coughs> And these American quilts represent equally inexpressible concepts, chance and time, which are here both depicted cyclically. So I took some of this research into, um, well, into all my future work from this point, but I'll um, talk you through some of it. Um, this was a book called Dot Source, um, and the subtitle is Five Illustrated Origin Stories. So each chapter begins with a small circle, and then a section of that circle breaks into dots, which then grow into an appendage. And bit by bit, new body parts grow until they solidify into lines. And eventually, the reader re realizes that a bird is coming into being. And each chapter ended with um, the bird in full color and composed entirely of painted dots. Um, so all of these birds were, were based on motifs from, sp I specifically chose the Gujarati textiles from my archive. So the word source in the title has a lot of different meanings. Um, and this project, um, for me, it sort of gets at the idea of an origin being an intangible idea. And I don't say that as a negative thing, it's just sort of part of how I think about um, cultural origins for myself. Um, but I will mention that for me, this book was important because it was actually the first time that I pointed to an aspect of Indian culture as a point of origin for, for my work at all. And this was just a few years ago. So um, with my painting work, I'm still going with the dots and the circles. I even did some ovals. Um, so this one is, um, I thought of these as sort of stretch circles. Um, this one stretched across two panels. And I was using title, the title pieced oval. Um, and I was making a, kind, a reference to quilt making with that word pieced. Um, I was really jumping around with scale. Um, small was better, because these took a long time to make. But the big ones were my favorite. Um, this one was about three feet wide by two feet tall. And working with this more monochromatic palette um, really helped me identify um, this kind of, um, the, like the swirling movement that happens between the white and the, this one's actually on dark blue. Um, yeah. And then this was, I think this is the, yeah, this was definitely the biggest one I ever made. And it was um, just recreating the smaller piece I showed you earlier. 
Um, and this, these are about a little less than four feet total. So this one took me a long time and it was, it, um, yeah, it took me a long time. And then in the, <laughs> in the end, I think when I look at it now, I think my favorite part of it is actually, can you see my mouse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite part of it's actually something that's really hard to see, which is at the border of the orb, I did um, a few rows of black on black, and that's my favorite part, <laughs> which you'll see in later work. So I did a lot of these, this series, and I always sort of grouped them into series form. Um, this group was called Satellites, and I thought of these as both microscopic and cosmic, um, and I was thinking about the human ability to discern and transcend differences in scale, distance, and perspective. Um, I like how they, um, they refer to molecular structure, cell structures, as well as planetary objects, as well as topographic maps. I did another series where I was painting over um, found objects. So these are on wooden bowls. I'm painting the inside of the bowls with dots. Um, these are on Lazy Susans. Um, yeah, so I'm referencing decorative painting on domestic objects, but at the same time, I think of these as referencing abstract landscapes while also referencing images of planets in space. So these are called orbits. They, they turn, obviously, because they're lazy Susans. Um, I went to Spain and became a little bit obsessed with hexagons while I was there. Um, I was looking at Gaudi's work all over Barcelona. Um, these sidewalk tiles were, um, so the pattern is constructed by rotating hexagonal tiles so that the three motifs kind of meet up as, as you walk down the sidewalk as, um, as these tiles build up. Um, I was really struck by his um, mosaic work at Park Güell, which is also in Barcelona, where he's using tile shards to make these mosaic pieces. And a lot of those tiles were actually made of fragments and were quite random. And I was really interested in how the lack of order was presented as equally beautiful and equally functional as the more patterned ones. So this trip made me want to try to relinquish some control over the dots in my work um, and to think about implying fragmentation or in-process formation, maybe time passing before or after a still moment. So I did this series um, that I called Fields, and then I um, tied it all together for a show that I titled Proof. And I was thinking about deductive reasoning in mathematics and again, sort of empirical research, um, which was very much the, the type of research behind this work, being in Barcelona and seeing his, his work. Um, so all of these images have the same template underneath them. And then I'm basically just tracing different parts of them to create these compositions. And I think when you saw the whole series, viewers were able to under, uh, sense a kind of underlying connectedness or something that they all had in common, even though they were all different. And then I did a series of tiles um, in this same body of work, also on, on a translucent vellum paper. And these were all, um, I, sh I, I wanted to show them on the floor to, to reference the, the sidewalk tiles. Um, but when they were just on the floor, they were sort of, I don't know, they were like flimsy and they were just sort of too static. So I made these little platforms and I made little thread drawings on pinheads to hold the, the drawings up a little bit. And since they were translucent, if you were standing right in, on top of them, you could see the little thread hexagons underneath the, the paintings. So this was, this was a series of about 30 drawings. Um, so at this time, I was living out west in Oregon, um, which if you haven't been there, you should definitely visit. Um, and it was the first time I lived kind of surrounded by such a dramatic landscape. Um, this image was taken in a house that I lived in for a year, which was very unusual, perfectly symmetrical A-frame house in the woods. and. I definitely, in retrospect, this became everyday research for me, just living in, in symmetry. <laughs> um, 
And traveling around the landscape, I saw things like this striated um, uh, geology in Eastern Oregon. And definitely was thinking about this as a geological pattern that's built up over time and space. These are the painted hills in Central Oregon. They're like amazing. Um, so along around this time, I made a body of work that I called striations. Um, and what you're seeing here is an installation view. Um, these were all made from um, repurposed clothing. I cut strips of cloth and formed patterns through systematized color and textural variations. And then I just used a sewing machine and sewed, stitched them all together. I used a really limited palette of chromatic grays and then little tiny hints of other colors. Absent of the bold color palette that I was used to working with, um, the edges were still clearly delineated, but the material became much more important in this work than it was in my painting work. Um, so looking at them closely, viewers could tell that there were, they, like, if you looked really close, you could tell that they were coming from discarded clothes. They were all pants, um, corduroys, jeans, formal slacks. Um, and while the viewers were noticing the subtlety of the color palette and specificity of material textures, that's what was important to me at the time. And I thought that knowing that they were pants wasn't important, um, but I was wrong. <laughs> and it was a discovery that sort of happened over like the next year or so. I, I like this work, but in retrospect, when I look at it, I do feel like I had moved a little bit too far over on the spectrum of formalism. This piece was made of six round forms. They were placed in a hexagonal layout. And I thought of these as bridging the gap between hexagon, circle, and stripes. So here are those three basic geometric concepts come together. Each circle has a unique stripe pattern. And then the overall composition is a result of chance because each disc is mounted on Lazy Susan hardware. So after placing them on the ground, I walked around the circle and I spun each one, and then where they stopped sort of determined the, the layout of the piece. So this was me relinquishing control. <laughs> um, on the left, you see a piece um, that I made using all the remnants from all those other um, pieces. And I installed it as a kind of um, decorative fringe um, on the border of the gallery, the architectural border. So soon after this, um, I did something that I'd never done before. It was called an open studio residency at the Museum of Contemporary Craft in Portland. Um, and I was given a large space uh, in, their, in an upstairs gallery and asked to turn it into my studio space for one intense week of making work with visitors um, invited to just come in and ask me questions all the time. <laughs> um, and this is when I realized that of course it's important that they're pants. <laughs> when there was people coming in all day saying, what is this material? What are you using? Why are you using it? Um, and that I realized that thinking that that wasn't important was pretty naive of me. And, and it's a little bit embarrassing because I was forgetting what I talk about with students in the fibers context every day. Um, the idea that's at the root of fibers as a field, which is that materials have meaning embedded in them, and textiles are an especially rich example of this. To use a textile means to reference the social, the political, the industrial, the hierarchical, the personal, the gendered, the cultural, the everyday, and it's important to not just refer to this content lightly, but to be responsible for your use of it. I wonder if Kelly and Barbara agree that's what we teach. <laughs> um, so as I sat at this gallery um, with a constant stream of visitors, I deconstructed 23 pairs of gray pants. And we talked a, a lot about pants versus skirts. We talked about the false neutrality of gray. We talked about cultural codes. And we talked about gender. Um, since 
most of my time was spent talking to people. This is how far I got <laughs> in that <laughs> week. Um, I mean, I cut, I cut up all the pants um, into even stripes, and I, and I um, finalized the, the pattern. So this is the layout of the 23 gray tones, and then I stitched together a few blocks, and then I went back to my regular studio, and I kept going. And a few weeks later, I finished sewing them all. Um, this was my biggest wall in my studio at the time, so this isn't the whole thing. This is about 15 feet of it. Um, and the whole piece in, in the end is 35 feet. So pretty big. It's like not huge, but it's pretty big. Um, and this project really made me start thinking about the relationship between pattern and infinity, which is like what I'm thinking about now. Um, so. Theoretically and mathematically, pattern is infinite. But when a pattern is materialized, it will always be finite. So these 23 pairs of pants could only give me that amount of material. And because of the way the pattern is made, it's physically impossible to continue growing the pattern. So in physical reality, the true potential of pattern will always be only potential, only theoretical, always bounded, always finite. It exists only in the realm of the potential, but the imaginary. So for here, that's like a loop back to my um, interest in fictional narratives. Um, so yeah, this project, it, it's, I think it's finally gonna be done um, this fall. I have all the blocks waiting. I've been waiting to know where it's gonna be shown, to what kind of space I'm gonna use because I want it to disappear into the edges of a space. So um, I think I have an opportunity coming up. Um, and then at some point, I also realized that what I had done was I had made a sari out of pants. <laughs> right? <laughs> I think that's like pretty clear. Um, and so I started to think about what an infinite textile would be and what it could mean. And for me, there's one source that immediately pops into my mind. Um, this is a comic book panel um, that is really like seared into my memory from childhood. And this is a, a teaser. I'm going to come back to this later. Um, so around this time, um, I was working with a group of artists. Um, we did a lot of shows together. And for this show, um, one, of, one of the artists Gave, came up with a prompt of this John Cage project called Fontana Mix, which later another musician named Max Newhouse had responded to with the project with feedback loops. So we came up with a, a title for the show called Fontana Mix Loop, and we all had to make work that responded to this idea. So I began, I began with a, this linguistic connection to the word loop um, and its relationship to the idea of repetition. So what I did was I took black vinyl fabric and I inscribed loops in the black vinyl fabric using um, just really sharp blades. And um, I was thinking about these as drawings, as using a knife as a drawing tool. So each cut shape or line droops and drapes uniquely depending on the material's reaction to gravity, tension, and even humidity became important to this work. Um, some pieces, like the one on the right, um, consist of taking those loops and then looping them back into the center of the piece. And then I did another series where I worked with this sort of column format instead of the square, um, but doing a kind of similar thing where I was cutting these drop shapes out and then letting the loops become this sort of dra line, this drawing line. Um, yeah. I'm going to take a math break here um, and just a little segue to talk a little bit about my like amateurish interest in math <laughs> um, that comes out of my interest in pattern. And for anyone in the room who's interested in pattern, it's definitely like a, a, a fun um, and important tangent to go down every once in a while. So um, all planar patterns can be described by 17 wallpaper groups. Um, wallpaper groups categorize pattern by their symmetries. And these types of um, transformations of pattern 
are rooted in Euclidean plane isometries. And that's all I can explain to you. Um, but I can say that um, there's amazing people who do understand <laughs> these ideas and who visualize them in all different ways. And I spend a lot of time just looking at um, stuff like this. So um, this is a website where somebody has um, animated the mathematical functions that are taking place. And my students who have done, who've taken my textile printing and drawing class, you guys know all this, right? You did it on tracing paper with pens. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop the math tangent there. Back to my work. Um, so in the next project, I grouped, I put together a, a body of work that I titled Anantha Undone. And with this body of work, I was thinking about how repetitive pattern might reconcile the limits of human experience within the infinite universe. I'll read you a little bit of the show text because it's, it's better than me. Um, so deploying fundamental motifs such as the block, circle, and stripe, I allude to a range of ways human have attempted to conceptualize or describe infinity. Geometric models, repetitive mark making, bolts of fabric, grains of sand. But the idiosyncratic materials interfere unpredictably in these metaphysical pursuits. And through manipulating them by hand, I reveal an inevitable human finiteness. Or finitude might be a better word. Um, so this body of work strings together. It basically is sort of cobbling together references that relate to infinity and impossibility. So the first is, is where the title comes from. And it's the concept of endless, limitless, or infinite that's described by a Sanskrit word, which is ananta. So in some Hindu myths, um, you can see a couple of illustrations here. The infinite takes the form of a thousand-headed serpent. Um, and he floats through the celestial sea of milk providing a resting place for the god Vishnu. Um, yeah. So images like this, I just, I love them. I love this thousand-headed serpent. I love everything about them. So for my title, I chose Anantha Undone to play with this word undone, or the, the idea of undoing, to suggest an unpacking or an unraveling or an attempt to understand the concept of limitless. And then the further suggestion with the title that such a search would ultimately be impossible or lead to one's undoing. Um, so one of the reference, the next reference was math. So now maybe you understand why I took a math tangent earlier. Um, and it's a reference to this problem of squaring the circle, which, um, it's a really old problem where um, the challenge is to construct a square with the same area as a circle by using only a finite number of steps with a compass and a straight edge. Um, in 1882, the task was proven to be impossible as a, the consequence of the lindemann weierstrass theorem, which proves that pi is a transcendental rather than an algebraic irrational number that it is not the root of any polynomial with rash, rational coefficients. I, I don't understand what these things mean, um, but I love the drawings, I love the concept, and I'm really, I'm looking for, with this show, I'm looking for examples of impossible tasks, impossible sort of ways of understanding um, experience. So, um, and then some of you may know that there's an expression of squaring the circle that is sometimes used as a metaphor for trying to do the impossible. So this was um, the piece I made based on that concept. It's a bisected circle which is made up of squares. And then within each square, there's a circle and a loop. Um, so again, I'm sort of working with that um, linguistic connection between loop and repeat. Um, I'm, with this body of work, I'm really interested in how each piece is part of a greater whole piece. 
Um, and each piece is unique in its own physical behavior. Each one has its own sort of gesture, its own droop, its own drape. Some of them are saggy. Um, the, some of them succumb to gravity, and some of them really try to rebel against gravity. Um, so I'm interested in how each of them have their own sort of in individuality, basically. Um, so the next reference in the show also deals with squares and circles. Um, it was a collaborative floor drawing um, with an artist named Sarah Nance, um, who's awesome, and I can't tell you all about her work, so I'm just going to give you a teaser here. Um, Sarah and I are both have this sort of um, uh, art, what I call an artist's interest in math and physics, um, and she's worked a lot with light and reflection and shadow and scale. Um, and if you're interested in seeing more, please visit her website. Um, we worked with the idea of sand, or the material of sand and the idea of circle packing. So in geometry, circle packing is the study of the arrangement of circles on a given surface so that there's no overlapping and that all the circles touch each other. Um, so it's a, uh, yeah, and then the, you can extend that into thinking about sphere packing. Um, so these are some of the kind of sources that we looked at and pretended that we understood. Um, and then these are things that we can understand. So for example, the, the practical application of these sorts of problems are things like, ship, like shipping needs. Um, so on the top you see an image of um, uh, tubes all packed into crates. Um, on the bottom you see a cannonball pyramid. Um, and on the right you see Tara Donovan's Hayes um, drinking straws installation. Um, so we made this piece called 13 to 1. So there's 13 circles um, packed into one square. And because it's made out of sand, there's also countless grains of sand in the piece. So it's, there's a sort of play on, on quant quantification, basically, of material. And sand, of course, is also um, definitely a reference to time and the passing of time. Um, I think of it as specifically relevant to the relationship between material and the continuity of time. So for example, if you think about an hourglass, when all the sand falls to the bottom, the, we sort of stop measuring time, but of course time continues beyond that. Um, but these are sort of some of the ways in which we as humans have tried to break up infinity into small portions, something that we can quantify and grasp in our hands so that we can understand them. Um, each circle is, we think of as a drawing, a planet, a molecule, and a landscape. Um, yeah, so then I did a series of drawings for this body of work. So these are all really exciting names, sphere packing numbers one through six. And for the last reference, um, I thought about bolts of fabric as a signifier of wealth and prosperity throughout human history. Um, I tried to fit this topic into this lecture, and then I cut it out because it's too much. Um, and I'm working on a whole other project that's um, about some of these ideas. Um, basically, economic imperialism and global wealth and their relationship with textiles um, over history. Um, so obviously, I can't go into that now, um, but if you, uh, we can talk later, <laughs> and I'll tell you some more. Um, I, I did want to just mention that if you haven't read about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement that was just signed last month by 12 nations, including Canada, not yet ratified. Not yet ratified, no. but signed. Needs to be. So people should yeah. look it up and think and just sort of check it out. Check out what's happening. Um, so anyway, I'm going to not go there. I almost <laughs> did, and then I was like, no. Um, so I'm, uh, I am going to mention a personal experience that was really important source for my Bolt of Fabric reference, and that was being um, being young and visiting India with my family and going fabric shopping. 
Um, and being in these stores where it's, it's an experience that, uh, yeah, just very formative for me, I think, pretty obviously. Being in a store and the shop owner will just pull out bolts and bolts and bolts of fabric and lay them out in front of you. And by the time you're done, the whole, the whole floor of the store is just covered in fabric. And it's an amazing, amazing experience. So this sort of thing has been um, formative for me and my relationship with fabric. It's always, it's interesting, it's always male shopkeepers too. Um, as you can see all this color and then this is my work. Um, <laughs> So this was a, so this town, the town that the show is in, I went to the fabric store and I asked for the biggest bolt of black vinyl fabric that they had in stock. And it was a 10 yard bolt of, of fabric. So that's what you're looking at here. It's just 10 yards of fabric cut into equal strips. Um, and then it's installed from the top of the partial wall to kind of show and hide the beginning point. And then at the edge, it's trimmed into a curve, which I was hoping would suggest it's sort of potential movement, like a serpent, like a snake, sort of crawling on the ground, as well as like a, a growth. Um, and if you go underneath it, which I think a lot of people went underneath it at the show, you can see the um, the, I didn't alter the back at all, so it sort of reveals its, its industrial source. It has all the stamps and marks from the factory on the back. Um, so after it was done, I thought of this. <laughs> um, basically long black hair um, it's cascading down somebody's back. And I didn't know what to title it, so I titled it Dropadi's Hair. And um, that's another reference to that comic book panel that I showed you earlier. Um, yeah, so that's my last complete body of work. That was last year. And since then, and this is, I'm going to end with this project. Um, since then, I've been working on a piece for a, a show called Everything Has Been Material for Scissors to Shape. Um, it's going to be at a museum in Seattle um, coming up this May. And the curator knew about my interest in narrative and storytelling and mythology. Um, and so she asked me to propose a project that deals with the transmission of myths and the formation of cultural diasporic identity, South Asian identity, basically, in America. Um, so these are my sources and I'm going to talk you through it. Um, I didn't, she just came up with the title pretty recently and she got it from a Pablo Neruda poem that um, if you haven't read it, I, I just have to recommend that you do. I know it's too small to read it up there, but it's called Ode to a Pair of Scissors. Um, it's really, really beautiful poem. Um, so I'll read you like tiny bits of my proposal. Um, I wrote that I've been preoccupied by two Hindu sources for many years. The first is the concept of the endless, limitless, infinite described by the Sanskrit word Ananta. You guys already know that. In certain Hindu myths, the infinite takes the form of this thousand-headed serpent who floats through the celestial sea of milk. The entire world is balanced on this serpent. And when the universe ends, Ananta will be what remains, restarting the cycle. Ananta does have a beginning, but no end in time or space. And for me, it represents an idea that's impossible for humans to comprehend. The second source is the character Draupadi. This is a pivotal character in the Mahabharat. She is the wife of the five Pandava brothers who are at the center of this great Sanskrit epic. And it's the impossibility of her role as a paragon of womanhood that I find gripping. So this is a comic book series that, that um, comes out of India called Amar Chitra Kata that um, I, I, I shouldn't say any Indian would know what Amar Chitra Kata is, but pretty close. Um, and I grew up on these. Um, and it was 
when I was asked to think about how mythologies formed my identity growing up in the States, this is the first thing I think of um, because these were brought to me my relatives. Um, my parents made sure I was reading all of these. Um, I loved them and I read all of them over and over again. The smell of them like conjures up memories for me. Um, and returning to them recently, um, I have discovered several problems that I have with them. Um, <laughs> but that's the point of the project. So, um, so Thropody is born from the fire, um, and she's born. So they, the, her parents are doing a ceremony because they're childless. And her, the, the king says, may an excellent son emerge from the fire. And the, his son emerges. And then to the amazement of all, there arose from the same fire a girl, a dark maiden too, wafting the fragrance of the blue lotus in bloom. And a voice from the, the heavens booms out, this girl is an exceptional woman. She will bring about the destruction of the Karavas which is another um, royal family. Um, and so she is named both Krishna and Draupadi. Um, yeah, so the comic book continues. At this scene, um, it's where there's a contest to see who gets to marry her. It's an archery contest. And Arjun, um, he shoots, he has to shoot an arrow into a fish by only looking down at the reflection in the water. So he does it, and she's excited, and so they're going to go get married. And then, um, so the, and meanwhile, the, the mother is at home. Oh, and Arjun has four brothers. There's five brothers. So her mom, the, their mom's at home wondering what happened, and they walk in, and she, they say, look, mother, look what we have brought today. And without looking, she says, whatever it is, share it equally and enjoy it. So they have a, a brief conversation um, where, you know, one of them won her in the contest, so it's proper that he marry her. And he says, but that would be committing the sin of ignoring my mother's orders. So the decision is, all right, then, Draupadi shall be a wife to all of us. So that's how she ends up with five husbands. Um, so, so the Mahabharata is full of all the, the, the rules, like what's right and wrong, what you should and shouldn't do. Um, the most famous scene in the Mahabharata um, introduces the idea of dharma or duty, which I know a lot of you are familiar with. So there's a scene in, the, in Draupadi's story in the Mahabharata when one of her husbands who has a gambling, he's gambling and he loses everything. He bets all of their belongings and eventually he bets himself and loses. He bets all of his brothers and loses them. And the last thing that he has to bet is her. And he loses the bet. So the winner goes to get her, and he grabs her by her hair, and he pulls her in front of this court full of people, and he tries to disrobe her by pulling her sari from her body. So he is sort of stripping her down. And she says a little prayer. She says, oh, Krishna, save me. And now I get to that panel that I've been teasing you with. So Krishna, who is an avatar of Vishnu, responds by transforming her sari into an infinite textile. No matter how long this guy tries to take off her clothes, there's always more fabric covering her body. So her honor is left mostly intact though she has been abused and greatly humiliated. So um, I, in doing research on this story, um, I came across the work of a really, really amazing scholar named Purnima Munkaker, um, who's a scholar and professor in gender studies and Asian American studies at UCLA. And in her um, work, she's written about Dopadi quite a bit, and she did a lot of research in Indian homes to find out that basically for, for most women, this scene is the climax of the Mahabharata. Um, whereas the, the sort of true climax of the Mahabharata is an epic battle at the end um, where all the, there's like a, a huge war, basically. Um, so anyway, um, 
In many ways, Thropathy exists as an icon of the vulnerability of women. And her subsequent anger, the rage of the quote unquote wronged woman, is also a common storytelling trope. Um, over the last year, I've found so many, so many illustrations of this moment in the story. And it's really been feeding my, my interest um, even more in feeding my project. So these are some examples of um, folk art from Bengal. And then these are some examples of um, Western artists tackling the scene. Um, and what I'm, what I'm really specifically pointing to in terms of my piece formally is the fact that in every illustration, there's always up in the top right corner, Krishna with the sari kind of pouring out of his hands towards her. Um, and this story has been um, depicted, so on the left you see a dance performance, on the right you see a movie, here you see scenes from a, tele, a, tele, a television series that's very, very, very dramatic. <laughs> um, <laughs> And she's often shown wearing red because she was born from fire. Um, I'm choosing not to use red though. Um, so I came across this quote as I was searching for images online um, and it, it just really stuck with me. While every incident of Mahabharata contains a lesson, one very important learning here is to not give in to one's whimsical desires and take all the consequences into account before making important decisions. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, so that's, this is sort of getting at what uh, I think for me is uh, coming out of this project is a lot of kind of um, uh, curiosity about what I was supposed to learn from these stories and why. Um, I'm curious in this sentence, like who had the whimsical desires and who was supposed to take yeah. consequences <laughs> into account before making important decisions. Um, and I've definitely like heard uh, interpretations. I know interpretations of the story where the blame is very much on her for some reason or the other um, for this happening. So what I'm making is an installation piece I'm using um, mostly fabric. I'm specifically using a type of fabric called Kadi that's from India. Um, it has a really strong tie to the Indian independence movement. Um, it's hand spun, hand woven fabric that's not exported. So I have all of this by bringing it back with me and bringing it back with family members because you can't buy it outside of India. Um, I'm making my, I'm making an infinite textile, or I'm trying to make an infinite textile by um, using a configuration in the gallery that implies a loop. Um, so the first section of it is her hair. I'm making, uh, this is pretty much done, it's, um, bl it's blue yarn that's been woven um, just up at the top to keep it all, keep all the thread together. And this will um, hang down off of a support beam in the space. And when I'm there, I'm going to trim it into that curve. Um, so right now, it's, it's, it's done except for that curve, which will happen on site. Um, the next portion of it is the sari. And the sari's pattern is inspired by serpent scales. And within the serpent scale, there's an overlay of her um, hair pat of, of a hair pattern. And my notes are reminding me that I must thank Janina Anderson repeatedly in this section of my talk, who um, figured out how to do all of this in Illustrator because I, I couldn't. Um, yes. So um, there's two patterns that are being sewn together because the Kadi is not wide enough to create the reference to the sari that I want. So basically I'm stitching together two different printed patterns. This is it stitched. And what makes me happy is that you can't really see the stitching, but there's 
a line of, of sewing that's sort of irregularly piecing the scales together. And the pattern gets stretched at the sides to reference the like a snake skin, um, but also it's referencing the borders because saris always have borders on the two sides of it. And then that fabric will be connected to a sea of milk pattern, which um, I'm borrowing directly from the print that I showed you earlier of the sea of milk. So this is the printed fabric that again, Janina figured out in Illustrator. Um, and this is it printed um, in repeat. So it turned out pretty much exactly how I wanted it to. So just to, I'm sorry to kind of skip back, but just to sort of talk through it, it's the hair attached to the beam, which then the snake scale fabric is gonna kind of go up above your head to the top of the room and then fall down this wall and eventually turn into the sea of milk pattern, which then is gonna loop back around to where the hair starts. So it's this sort of, it's, a, it's in, infinite by referring to a loop, basically. Um, and that's it. I have about a month to finish this. And I'm gonna stop there and say thank you so much. And I would love to answer questions. Well, thank you. That was so wonderful. And um, what I loved, I think, the most is that you paired almost like half and half all of your work and all of your research, Ooh, cool. which leads into my question. Okay. Um, I'm wondering that uh, what you think research is for you, uh, because it comes from so many different sources, if you could just give a definition. And also, because it seems to take such an important toll on the work that you make, do you consider yourself researcher and artist, artist who does research, a researcher who makes artwork, just where you stand in that? Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's a question that I've never thought about as much as um, I have since moving to Montreal. Um, <laughs> this seems to be a question on people's minds, and it's certainly on mine too. Um, I, yes, I consider myself a researcher. Um, I see all the aspects of of what I look at and what I make as part of my research practice. Um, so I don't, I, I don't kind of separate when I'm looking at, say, a historical image like this. In my mind, that's not separate from being in the studio and drawing with, with ink and brush on paper. Um, it's always, to me, research is defined by whatever helps you answer a question and or generate the next question. Um, so, yeah, it's, and to me it's not about ever figuring anything out, it's just about setting myself up for what else I have yet to figure out. Um, <laughs> so for me, research is about generating questions. Um, I do do a lot of, like, like historic visual research. Like I, look at, I look at images um, and think about what they're trying to tell me. Um, and then I, I do a lot of like super informal like Google research, um, and then I read a lot. Um, like I said, I've been recently um, reading a lot of work by um, people who, who specifically study Asian American sort of topics, which is really new to me, so nobody asked me hard questions about that. And um, <laughs> then, yeah, and then like learning about um, um, this pattern, like I've done a lot of work with pattern, obviously, but this new project has taken way more like hands-on studio research than anything I've ever made before, um, which has been super challenging and, and really interesting, too. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Cool. Maybe one of the best answers all year to that question. <laughs> oh, one of the most curious. thorough, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question that you're following this. Sure. Um, so, would you describe your work as some, some sort of uh, archaeology? And is there any ethics in regards of the representation? Um, since you're like dealing with um, specific uh, cultural um, elements. Um, what do you think, Han? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'll answer it, but I'm just curious about, like, what are you thinking about ethics? 
Well, in, in terms of responsibility, in terms of like yeah. representing, uh, you know, a certain kind of culture that we're not necessarily yeah. aware of. When right. you talk about job and all this, there's this like heritage that you're you've been exposed to as a youngster and um, <coughs> you somehow own and understand. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay, therefore, great. Or like then you're you, you're becoming some sort of an agent in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I, um, I'll say that for me, uh, I'm very aware that um, I can only speak for myself and I can only speak for my experience. I hope that, that there's ways for everyone to connect to the work, regardless of background um, or life experience. Um, and when I make choices and decisions and I use source materials, I just, I, I do ask the ethical question and I answer it for myself with each decision that I make. And if I feel like, I mean, I, I feel like I use sources respectfully um, and critically at, at the same time. And if I can be doing both of those things together, then I think it's a, it's a thumbs up, it's a go. Um, I don't, um, so this, uh, this project is like super new and I've never actually made a piece, I've never been asked to make a piece about my relationship to cultural identity before. So it's been really, it's been really challenging and it's been really different and it's, that's why I've been doing, I think, extra research and being even more responsible to the ideas that I'm, that I might be pointing to so that I know so I can sort of predict um, any pitfalls before they happen. And to me, I think that's kind of the, be the best way to make sure that I'm not doing anything problematic is just to know the subject matter as much as possible, while also being really honest and aware that I'm, I'm talking about my experience um, as somebody who, I mean, who had a very specific, who has had a very specific life story that is not like anyone else's, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, is that, I don't know. Well, if I, because I think when I was saying archeology, span Oh yeah, I forgot um, that part. <laughs> I think in terms of the sources being, uh, in one way being the internet, for example, then mm -hmm. like sourcing your material from mm -hmm. communities that are more isolated and therefore like more kind of essential in that way, I think, you know, and your approach is of course they're personal and you are becoming, um, a voice in a way, of course, but I think uh, I think it's really le le legitimate that you're claiming this, and therefore it can have its own identity and power. In that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've never thought of the word archaeology in relation to my work before, so so thank you, and I definitely will um, think about what that might mean in relation to my work. Um, yeah, and I guess I haven't. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't thought about that word yet. On okay. We'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> do, do you have in mind um, the panelist? What what the panelist from yesterday was saying about it's been Dominic Gagnon's archaeological there's work? There's a bit of that, but mm -hmm. I think there's, I think, um, it's, well, I mean, for the people that were in there last night, but it's just, I think there's just this, like, kind of ownership and also the sources, I think, were not really addressed last night, mm -hmm. and I think this kind of, um, research that is also either happening in your past and these sources that are like material, but then therefore there's also this like discovery that happens through uh, this device that's called the internet. I mean, and then <coughs> becoming mm -hmm. some sort of like um, a filter and then making new meaning and new associations. I think this is really uh, interesting and this idea of responsibility and ownership and authorship, all of these things, I think, are still being defined. So I was mm -hmm. just curious about the perspective yeah. on that. Well, I can tell you that one thing that I've, that I've been coming across a lot as I'm, as I'm thinking about specifically the transmission of these myths mm -hmm. uh, from India to America and to, to me, to my house, um, is how there is no um, I, I've been, you know, for a while I thought I might find some sort of origin story to these things, like some version that was the true version or the first version or the real version, um, and there's no such thing. And so I think in a way that that might relate to your archaeology question is I've been sifting through 
all of these different versions of Draupadi's story and just realizing that every version has a voice behind it and has somebody trying to tell people something through her story. And so I'm only getting, and anyone is only getting a filtered version of, these, of this story. Um, there, it's, actually, it's like impossible to find where it came from. So I've come across versions that, so my comic book didn't tell me this, but I've come across many sources that, have, that told me that Draupadi was famous for being a very learned and wise and a woman who knew all the scripture and knew all the sort of law of the time. And so when she was lost in the bet, she had like a, like a really, really long debate with the members of the court about if she could even be lost as property. And, there's, and like coming across that story, I was like, I didn't know that. Like I grew up with this version that she was just this sort of weak person who was like dragged across the floor by her hair, was stripped, was tried, they tried to strip her naked at the end, you know? But it turns out she actually, well, and I don't know, maybe is that the true version? I don't know which one's the true version. And I think that's kind of the way in which I might be enacting a sort of archaeological process is by sort of sorting through all of this stuff, um, but realizing that there's no one that I can like grab onto and say, yeah, that's the one, you know? Um, Hi. Hi. Um, from an educator standpoint, um, teaching fibers, textiles to students, how do you find that as a teacher um, that has shaped your work as an artist or has it at all? Oh my god, it has like in huge ways. You're kidding? Oh my god, you're on my <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's why I'm a teacher because otherwise I, I, I don't know how I would like learn anything new or and like keep up the energy for learning and um yeah and you guys give me you you're i mean you guys give me great ideas like every day um you can ask my partner how often i just go home and tell him like everything you did um, in your class um, especially here at, sorry to give you a big head but concordia students are the best students i've ever worked with yeah <laughs> Did you want me to be more specific? No, no, no. Just, just, just wondering, because uh, just because being in art education, trying to balance what an educator is compared to being an artist, just wondering for yourself, like not losing yeah. inspiration or being lost in, um, you know, curriculum or grading and having yeah. so many students and so many things to grade. Just having time for yourself as being an artist and being inspired. That's a big question I have um, as myself as being an educator yeah. and an artist at the same time. Mm -hmm. Trying to find that balance, mm -hmm. and it seems that you have. Um, as like inspiring as it is that you do have shows and you do have um, displays and you do have your own work as well as having time to teach. Just wondering, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about balance. <laughs> if, I don't know if I found the balance, but um, I'll say that um, for me, like the reason why being an artist and an educator at the same time works so well is because, I, I mean, one of the reasons is I think that um, being an artist is all about like always learning new stuff and like always making sure you're educating yourself on, on what you don't know yet. And so they work together really well to like be doing that in your own studio and then to go to a classroom and like work with other people on, on that with them too, you know? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Cassandra. You're nice. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is very, very technical and okay. it's on a specific work. Mm -hmm. Maybe your answer is very short and technical too, but I'm just very curious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the, um, your infinite fabric that you're making right now, mm -hmm. so I was wondering about how, why did you decide uh, like first to keep the border on each side of the fabric? Mm -hmm. And also like obviously the, the, your choice of the length was uh, making because of the room. Yeah. But the, I, I'm curious about the choice of the uh, of the width, the width. and uh, how uh, trying to frame and illustrate infinity, which I think is like super exciting. Cool. How do you make this kind of decision mm -hmm. about 
primate and companions on, on, yeah. on the support. So there's two, um, there was two reasons that I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. So, or maybe there's three, I'll just start saying them. So the first is that um, <laughs> Kadi comes at 35 inches wide and Staris are generally about four feet wide. So I wanted to make up some of that difference. So, um, so I, I ended up on 44 inches. And the reason is because the room has track lights that are 48 inches apart. And I need my piece to fit in between the two tracks. So it, it's like, it's, it's, a space, it's a space thing, totally. And then um, I needed to use, I wanted to use borders, one, to, um, to reference, because if you look at the way a snake skin looks, if it's like with flattened, the scales on the side are that go around the side of the snake are are longer, like elongated scales. So I wanted to reference that, um, and again, I wanted to reference sari borders, because the sari border will always have. If you look at a woman wearing sari, there's always a border at the bottom, and then the top one's like tucked into the petticoat. So I wanted to refer to that as well. Yeah, that was, I like that question. <laughs> <laughs> 44 inches. <laughs> well, if you're doing infinity, an eight is an infinity symbol too, correct? Right? So four and four is an eight. Oh, there you so go. So you've got your infinity thing going. Yeah. Actually, that's crazy that you said that because you know that piece I, I showed, the one that I'm not done with with all the gray stripes? I'm thinking about making that into an into the infinity symbol using two movable walls and like wrapping it around the two walls. I don't know, it might be a little cheesy, but it might look cool. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, who's thirsty? <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a reception planned for uh, after this talk. Serbi, thank you so much. Thank you all so much. This was fun.